Good morning and welcome to our next installment of Explore Your Outdoors. Today we're joined by Ellen Erickson from the Natural History Museum of Utah who will be sharing with us how you can engage in the City Nature Challenge. Don't know what that is? You're about to find out. So just some quick information about who we are as you see before we turn the time over to Ellen. Our mission is to promote excellence in environmental education and community engagement to connect all Utahns to their natural world. We do that as, Utah, as the Utah affiliate of the North American Association for Environmental Education. As a combined network, we have a reach and impact of over 200,000 educators a year, and we work to ensure that everybody can connect to amazing environmental education opportunities like this. Some of the things that we do in the scope of our work are supporting things like Utah Green Schools, this is a pathway to Department of Education Green Ribbon School Certification and any school in Utah who's participating in sustainability efforts, student health efforts, and environmental education is welcome to apply and participate. It's a great way to get your school recognized. We offer professional development for educators, individuals who work at environmental nonprofits and city and state agencies. So uh, visit our website to learn more about the opportunities we have available. And finally, we advocate on behalf of environmental education. Um, we do that through our work for uh, developing an environmental literacy plan for the state of Utah and advocating for federal funding to support environmental ed. We have some great upcoming opportunities. There are two more Explore Your Outdoors series happening this May and June, and those are free to participate. So head on over to our website to learn more. Um, we do have our conference coming up in November and our awards coming up in August. So feel free to visit our website to learn more about the work that we do. And just know that we depend on community support. We're really thankful for our partners with uh, um, from Zoo Arts and Parks that are making this program possible and the many other partners that help to support our work to deliver environmental education here in the state of Utah. So with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Ellen to share a little bit more about how you can explore your outdoors with the City Nature Challenge. Thanks so much, Alex. Thanks for having me and thanks to the Utah Society for Environmental Education for all that you do in the state of Utah and beyond. It's something I hold near and dear to my own heart. I'm thrilled to be here today. So I I am psyched to be talking about a fun event that can get you and your family and your students and your neighborhood involved in some fun nature exploration, but also to contribute to science. So let me share my screen here and get rolling. So Alex mentioned it's called the City Nature Challenge and I'd love to dive into how you can get involved and get your hands dirty or not so dirty, uh, having fun with the City Nature Challenge this weekend. Uh, I'm Ellen Erickson, the coordinator of citizen science at the Natural History Museum of Utah. And for some background on the citizen science program at the Natural History Museum, really it's all based in getting the community involved in science. Science is a conversation and people are a really important part of that. And so we connect people with science and scientists to really connect people with their local nature and fun explorations of, of what's happening right here in Salt Lake City and, and beyond too. So the City Nature Challenge, it's a four day event, global participation, connecting people with urban nature. In a nutshell, that's what it is. It's this amazing record of biodiversity data that comes together on a global scale, connecting people with the nature's literally right outside of their homes. You've got things when you walk out of your door that you might not even be noticing little insects that thrive and have entire lives right inside your parking strips, in your garage, the place you park your car, lots of places outside. And then all of these things are or can be of interest to science and scientists. And then through the, the City Nature Challenge, there's this community that gets created, not just with you connecting with the natural community of things outside your home and in your neighborhoods, but also people online who are into nature also. There's a fun conversation that happens and you'll see and learn more about that as I talk. So how do you get involved? Well, you find wildlife and you take a picture of it and you share it online. That's what the City Nature Challenge is rooted in, looking for things, photographing them, 
and then posting those observations to the internet or onto an app. We use a platform called iNaturalist. iNaturalist is an amazing tool. It's a global database of nature observations. It's free. You can access it online at iNaturalist.org. Upload your photos there, or you could have a you could have it on your mobile device. I use it on my phone all the time. It's a free app you can download. Take your pictures from there, upload your photos from there, and it gets saved to the platform. Last year, they celebrated 50 million observations in just over 10 years of their existence, and in less than a year, they broke that record, and they're they're up to over 63 million observations as of this morning, which is pretty exciting. The platform is based on all of these observations that people are making. So you walk outside, you see a butterfly in your backyard, you take a photo of it, and it gets added to the platform as a data point. So all of these red dots represent 63 plus million observations that people have made globally. Pretty cool. As you zoom in, it starts to get more detailed. Each pin has a different color based on the taxa that it belongs to, plants, animals, all kinds of wildlife. So iNaturalist is, is based in observations of wild living things or evidence of wild living things that you're seeing outside. So the City Nature Challenge started with the California Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum of LA in 2016. They do citizen science programming. They connect people and communities with science through their organizations. And they thought, hey, let's have a little competition and see who can find the most urban nature over a four day period? Is it gonna be San Francisco or is it gonna be LA? When you think of those places, you don't necessarily think about nature. I think of a lot of things when I think of San Francisco and LA before, before nature. But it turns out nature is all over those cities and most, not most, all cities globally. We just don't always see it or we aren't looking for it. So that first year in 2016, those two cities participated as a competition to see who could find the most. And collectively, they made over 19,000 observations of wild living things in their cities with about a thousand people participating, pretty cool. So they had a great time, it was fun. They told other people about their success and people at the Natural History Museum of Utah heard about the City Nature Challenge and said, we'd like to join you. So in year two, the Natural History Museum of Utah organized a Salt Lake City contingent to represent the City Nature Challenge with 15 other cities. And collectively that group, as you can see here, made about 125,000 observations of 8,000 plus different species. Pretty amazing. Fast forward to last year, 2020, the City Nature Challenge has grown in participation every single year by wonderful and impressive amounts. Last year was a little bit different because of COVID and global access to nature outside. And so the competition element was suspended and it really became this global effort to collaborate in making nature observations. And so with that global collaboration of over 240 cities in 40 different countries, there were over 800,000 observations of nature made in a four day period. That's pretty cool. Utah has seen some wonderful successes in the City Nature Challenge too. That first year we called ourselves Salt Lake City. That was the city participating. And every year since we've grown and expanded what our city is. And so now Salt Lake City is not an appropriate title for our city. We call it the Wasatch, which is a conglomerate of eight different counties along the Wasatch front, the Wasatch back and up into Cache County uh, as well, or Cache Valley as well. So we've got Fox Elder, Cash, Davis, Salt Lake, Summit, Utah, Wasatch, and Weber counties all participating in this big Wasatch conglomerate uh, that, we, that we use as our city here in Northern Utah. Last year, we broke some wonderful records. I was not sure what the turnout was gonna be with COVID. We were early into staying home and staying safe. And people were psyched to safely get outside and take photos. It was a beautiful time of year and I certainly welcome the excuse to get outside and explore um, and that connectivity that it brings knowing that other people are out there doing the same thing. So we doubled our observations last year. We had 170% increase in the people participating. So exciting to see Utahns come together 
to look for local nature. So we're at it again this year. Oh, more successes here we've got. Um, so of all of the, of the oh, nearly 7,000 observations that Utahns made last year, 24 of them were rare, threatened or endangered species. So there are exciting things that come out of this data collection. It's you getting outside, exploring your neighborhood, your city, the areas surrounding your neighborhoods and cities to find the things that live there uh, that aren't people. And they're not things that we're planting or pets that are hanging around. It's the wild stuff that's out there. And from those observations that you make, you out there as an individual person are seeing these unique things at special times. Like it's a unique time and a place that you're, you're witnessing this organism existing. And by photographing it, you're then recording it on the iNaturalist platform forever as a data point to share what's happening there. And sometimes you might be photographing something that's scientifically important. Maybe it's a species that we don't see very much because it's rare, threatened, or endangered. That information helps city managers and others understand where these species might be living and how they might be able to protect those areas a little bit better by, for example, not spraying weeds with, with, um, with, with toxins that would maybe harm insects that are threatened, um, and having other sorts of management practices that could be useful and, and kind, I guess, to some of these wild things. There are wonderful examples, both in Utah and globally, of cool things that have been found. People locate or photographing species that have never been seen in an area before at all, which happened in, uh, which has happened in some places. Um, and finding things that are of interest. There's a photo here of a, of a European firebug down here in the right uh, hand corner of the screen that was found in Cache County. That's an introduced species of insect that's been in the state of Utah for about 10 years. The first time it was officially recorded existing in North America was right here in Salt Lake City about 10 years ago. And, and since then it's been expanding its range and it can be found all across the city. And we track this insect's movement using the iNaturalist platform based on the observations that people are making. And last year, just before the City Nature Challenge, or maybe it was right at the beginning, somebody photographed a European firebug in Cache County for the first time. Perhaps they had been living up there, there just hadn't been photographic evidence of that. And so this is an amazing way to communicate with people that might be studying these things who aren't traveling to places. The state of Utah is a large place. And if you're looking for European firebugs by yourself or with a small team of researchers, it's gonna take you a really long time to go everywhere and look for that insect and really nobody has that sort of time. And so it cannot, research like this cannot happen without the eyes and ears, and in this case, cameras of citizen scientists, just like you, who are seeing some cool stuff. So you never know what you might find. And I love that so, 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 so much. The City Nature Challenge really is a fun thing for lots of people. I am a nature nerd. I am so excited about this because I love to get out and make these observations and find things. It's so fun. Um, but it's also kind of part of my job and it's a good thing that I am passionate about it and love it. I'm grateful for that. But it's fun for all types of people too. I have scientists at the museum who get super psyched to make observations but are even more excited to see what observations are made. This is a quote from a mom who is a, a museum member and every year takes her family out to do city nature challenge things. It, it, it says here each year brings a unique experience, lots of family fun. We find something new every year and it's always so exciting. The challenge offers something special for everyone in my family. I love just having time outside to explore new places. The kids love to, the thrill of the hunt for something that's unique or being able to name a local species. And my husband loves the photography side of the challenge. So I think this is a pretty cool thing that this family of four gets outside every year they all have different things that they love about it and they collaborate together to make these amazing scientific observations on their family iNaturalist platform where they post these amazing photos of, of observations that they're seeing and they find great stuff every year. So you know about the City Nature Challenge and how you can participate. You just have to find wildlife, take a picture of it, put it on the iNaturalist platform the great news is that it's happening right now, today. It started yesterday, April 30th. It's going through May 3rd, which is this Monday. 
get out, make observations of nature that you're seeing, take those photos and put them on the iNaturalist platform. Let's see how many we can get. There are 400 plus cities participating this year, which is an amazing number. Globally, people are doing this right now as we speak everywhere in every type of ecosystem you can think of. They're swimming in the ocean, they're combing the beaches, they're looking for through the rainforest. The biodiversity here in Northern Utah is pretty special and unique and so different from many of those places. This is an amazing time for us to photograph those things, to not only learn about them ourselves, appreciate them ourselves, tell our local scientists and managers about the things that are out there to help with research and understanding of our local communities of biodiversity. But it's also a great way to talk about this stuff and showcase Utah's biodiversity on a global stage. How exciting is that? So here are some tips if you're gonna get into the City Nature Challenge when we're done with this talk, which I hope you do. These are my suggestions. The first thing is make sure you're taking photos of wild organisms. When you go outside, of course, in an urban setting, there are many beautiful plants. Sometimes they're things that we put in our own gardens or gardens that other people have cultivated and planted. Those aren't the types of things that help biodiversity data. When we think about plants in an urban setting, tulips are beautiful, but they're not necessarily contributing to plant biodiversity. So taking pictures of a tulip and adding it to the City Nature Challenge project isn't the most ideal. It's better to find those weeds growing in the cracks of the sidewalk or things that are popping up in your garden that you're about to pull before you do that, take a photo of it. Those are the things that are naturally occurring here. And those are what are, those things are interesting to scientists because if someone's not planting them there, they're occurring on their own. Why? How are those seeds spreading? All of that sort of, your photo tells a story of, of that kind of thing. So that's, those are the kind of photos we wanna be seeing. As you're taking a picture, think of it really as having a thousand words attached to it. You are communicating so much with your photo of that natural thing with the photo itself. So having a photo that's clear, if it's not ideally not blurry, that's gonna make what you're photographing more identifiable. Having multiple photos of a thing can also be helpful, especially if you're thinking about insects and plants. If I, find, if I go outside right now, I could easily take a picture of a dandelion in my yard. What am I saying? I'm definitely going to go outside and take a picture of a dandelion in my yard when I'm done with this presentation. I'll take a picture of the entire plant so you can see it, all of it in a clear way. But then I'm going to zoom in and take another photo that's a close up of the flower if it's got one. If it has seeds, I'm going to zoom in and take a picture of that too. I'm going to get a photo of the petals or the, <laughs> the leaves of the plant. So you can see the definition of how those, the leaves are, are formed. And then also of the stem, how the leaves connect to the stem. All of those things are really important information for somebody who knows about plants because that's how they're able to key it out and understand the species that it is. If it's just sort of a blurry photo of a casual dandelion, sure we could say, okay, that's a dandelion, but dandelions can be identified even more specifically to the species level. And so the better your photo is, or suite of photos that you take, you can add, I think, six to 10 photos in one observation of a thing, the more information you're sharing with scientists. So I say here, get as close as you can, make it obvious what you're photographing. This is something that happens occasionally, people will be outside, they'll see a beautiful vista, they take a picture of nature and they put it on iNaturalist, it's confusing to an identifier, someone who's looking at that to say, okay, what is it that this person's trying to take a photo of? Is it the beautiful bush here? Is it the tree over there? Was there a coyote hiding in the bushes that we couldn't see? As you take a photo and make that observation on iNaturalist, think of it as being about one organism. And so you want your photo and photos to focus on that one organism as much as possible. So it's obvious what you're taking the photo of. Think like an expert. This is a really important topic or a really important thing to think about when you're getting into the iNaturalist platform. I didn't really discuss this, but once your photo is added to the iNaturalist platform, it has this really amazing AI capability. It has this technology where you'll take the photo and I can, I'll demonstrate this for you shortly. It'll take, you take the photo, you add it on and iNaturalist will think about your photo and suggest to the best of its ability what it thinks that organism is. 
if you don't know what the organism is, it's super helpful for that. That tool is amazing because it'll help put it in, into some buckets of things that it could be. Then you can save your observation and it becomes this, as I mentioned earlier, a data point on the iNaturalist website. That then is viewable to anyone who uses iNaturalist. People like me who are casual amateur naturalists, people who I work with are insect specialists, plant specialists, scientists who know a lot about a specific area. Those people can then go onto the platform too and say, oh wow, look at this dandelion picture. It's labeled as a dandelion. Let me see if I can figure out if it's something a little more specific. Oh yes, based on the observation that I see, I know this is a common dandelion. That Now that organism's been identified to the best of its ability. That's super cool. That's part of this conversation that's happening online. So when you're thinking like an expert, when you make your observation, you're thinking, okay, how can I make this observation of nature that I'm seeing have the most information it possibly can to help somebody learn as much as they can about it. There's a notes section where you can type notes and say, oh, I saw this, there was a honeybee on the dandelion and that sort of thing. You can give some observations about things that you're seeing to fill in that picture a little more. You also could be the expert and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but you can be making these IDs on the iNaturalist platform too. If you happen to know a lot about specific taxon areas, get into iNaturalist and help people identify what they're finding. It's super fun to do. If you don't know that much about stuff, again, maybe you're like me, you're sort of a casual amateur naturalist. I know a little bit about a lot of things is what I like to say. I'll go in and I try to help identify to the best of my ability. And as I'm helping identify things and looking through, I'll talk about this more. As I do that, it helps me become a better naturalist and then a better, observer on the iNaturalist platform. My, I, I'm much better at making insect observations, for example, now than I used to be, because I know when somebody, for example, is trying to identify a ladybug, I know that they need to see multiple parts of that ladybug's body, because if it's just a picture of one side, you can't see what all the spots are. Having pictures of the top and the front of their face and the sides of their body show markings from different angles that help identify that species, which is pretty cool. So that has helped, all because I've been helping to ID stuff on iNaturalist. When you're outside, please be safe and respect not only other people, especially during these times, but wildlife that you're finding. Don't go tromping across plants just to take a cool picture of a big moose that you happen to see. If you do see a moose, be safe. <laughs> Don't get too close. Respect that wildlife, of course, and yourself. And then if you're catching insects, with, thing, with tools that you might happen to have, nets and containers to capture them in, that's a great way to photograph them closer. But then when you're done, let them go where you, where you caught them. Uh, I just mentioned tools, bring tools along with you to help. They're amazing things. I have containers and all sorts of things around me that I'll share when I'm not, when I'm not sharing my screen anymore. And then of course, my last tip is being patient. Sometimes finding nature, especially in an urban setting, means slowing down, taking a walk at a different kind of pace and looking a little bit closer to see what's crawling around on the ground, flying from tree to tree. The slower you're moving, the easier your eyes can start to focus in on stuff that is around. Okay, so now you know, take photos and add them to iNaturalist. You can help ID what others are finding. Through May 9th, the City Nature Challenge observation periods and observation period ends this Monday, May 3rd. But then through May 9th, we have another week to be identifying things. So helping get things identified to the, the best we can with their species level. And so that's a great time for you to go in and do that sort of thing. If you also happen to take photos on say a DSLR or something that's not a smartphone and you wanna add pictures to the iNaturalist platform, through the web browser, you can do that through May 9th as well. As long as your observations were made between April 30th. So maybe you took pictures of some nature in your yard yesterday and you didn't know about the City Nature Challenge. Fear not, you could add those observations today and honestly, anytime through May 9th to the iNaturalist platform and that'll automatically get aggregated into our project. And then you can look for results being announced the week of May 10th. That's when we'll talk about the global collective effort and of course also the fun Utah successes and ideally the fun, exciting things that we've, that we've seen. For those who are tuning in, <laughs> 
after the fact, if you're watching this as a stream or if you're I mean, tuning in now as well, here are some helpful links that you can go to for more information about the City Nature Challenge with the Natural History Museum of Utah. We have over 20 partners in the state of Utah. The Utah Society for Environmental Education is one of them, helping to organize and make this year's event awesome. They are fabulous resources, videos, links to programs that are happening both in person, virtually, or sort of on your own that organizations are hosting from Cache County down into, into Utah County and the Provo area. There are fun things for you to do. So check out that information on the museum's website, nhmu.utah.edu slash citizen science. You can join the iNaturalist project talking about the Wasatch, I'll, I'm gonna go there after I'm done with this presentation to show you what the live view of observations coming in is. That's where you can check it out. Um, and then of course, as you're making identifications, I've got more information on my Natural History Museum website. If you go to that citizen science page, look for the City Nature Challenge link and you'll find a little section of that page that says stay connected. Help ID is hyperlinked, click on that and it's got more information there for you. I'm so excited to see what everybody finds this year. And I'll see you out there, you know, in sort of a, a virtual social distance wave at you from afar kind of way. I'll be the one out in the middle of, you know, weedy fields and people's park strips on my knees, taking pictures of little bugs crawling around. <laughs> Cause that's where I like to be finding some fun stuff. So that's, that portion of this presentation. I'm super open to any questions that might be coming in. So Alex, if they're coming in and you want to put them in a chat or you just want to pop in and ask them of me, go for it. My plan now is to do another screen share of the iNaturalist project and see what things are going in the project. And then I was going to do a little demonstration. Actually, you know what? I'm going to, switch, I'm going to swap, swap that. First, I'll do a demonstration, a demonstration of how to make an observation on iNaturalist from my phone. And then we'll go look on the project to see where that observation landed and then what other people are finding. Okay, so new kind of screen share here with my mobile device. Okay. Here we have my iPhone, I'm gonna to go to my iNaturalist app. When I go into the app, it's gonna showcase all of the observations that I've made ever on the app thus far. You can see these little boxes on the side, this one that's red means that I've got a new message that just showed up on this observation that I made recently. And so this is a spider observation. Sorry, sorry if you're squeamish about spiders. I used to be, and then I started taking the pictures of them on iNaturalist and it, it's changed my whole worldview. I took a picture of this spider yesterday. I suggested it was a funnel weaver. It looks like I was wrong. Uh, and so this person, um, this person's telling me that it's a, a, a wolf spider, which is super exciting. Uh, so this is part of this conversation that happens. I, to the best of my ability, put what I thought this spider was. I see funnel weavers in my yard all the time. This guy was super, super tiny. He was running across my yard. Um, super fast and I just happened to have a little bug jar with me. So I caught him. Since he was so fast, there was no way I was gonna photograph him well. So I put him in my fridge for a few hours, actually more than I care to admit because I sort of forgot he was in there when I was doing some other stuff. He was totally fine. He had air or it had air. I don't know what the gender of this <laughs> or the sex of this spider is. Um, it was totally fine. I took it out, put it in a deep bowl. It was moving a little bit slower. I was able to use the macro setting on my phone to take as close a picture as I could. Spiders are a really important thing. And again, sorry if you're squeamish about it. Spiders are a really important thing to get close to. So close that you can see their eye pattern, actually, if that's possible. Seeing the eye, so spiders have lots of eyes. They vary from, I think, two up to six. I think um, they have lots, but it depends on what species they are. And all of the, those eyes are arranged in different kinds of patterns. And so this person is telling me that this wolf, this has a wolf spider eye arrangement, which means I took a photo where they could see their eye arrangement, which is pretty exciting. Um, so there, I took several different photos. These photos can get bigger if I click on them, but I'm not gonna do that. Anyway, so this is part of that scientific conversation, which I think is super exciting. I'm digressing. So. 
if I'm going to make a new observation, I went out this morning and I took some photos. So at the bottom, I didn't really show you this, at the bottom of the screen on my iPhone, there's a camera and it says observe. I'll click on that. If you happen to have a non-Apple device, likely when you look at your iNaturalist app, it'll have a little plus sign. It might say add photo, but it'll be something that looks like adding something to the site. Both Android and Apple devices have the ability to either take a picture in the moment. So I could do that now. I could click on camera. It would go live to my camera. That's my finger over the camera right there. Um, that's not my preferred way to take photos on a naturalist. I take pictures first on my camera app on my phone, and then I go into the iNaturalist app later to upload my photo. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate for you now. So camera, roll, and it's going to list my most recent photos. And so these are a bunch of nature pictures I was taking out this morning. The one I'm going to make for you right now is this squirrel. So I'm so nerdy that I'll go in to my photos. I'll take a whole bunch. Squirrels are moving bugs are moving, birds are flying, I'm snapping as many pictures as I can. And then I, I go back in and I find the best ones, the clearest ones, the ones that show, tell the story that I wanna be telling. And I'll give them a little heart um, so I can identify them easily. And then I select the ones that I want. These are the two that I wanna to add to my observation. And I'll say add, top right. And it's going to pull up this draft observation. You can see the two photos that I have listed are here. If I wanted to add more photos, I would click on this plus button. And then this is the coolest part. It is a little question box and it says, what did you see? I'm going to touch that box. And it's going to think about it. This picture is a little tricky because there's there are some leaves in this tree that I've got out front. So there's a, it's kind of a busy photo. So the iNaturalist app is saying, okay, we think it's a squirrel, but we're not sure specifically what it is, but these are our top 10 suggestions. I know for a fact that this squirrel that I saw is a fox squirrel. The Natural History Museum of Utah researches fox squirrels. We do a lot of wonderful citizen science projects based on fox squirrels. I'm very familiar with this animal. So I'm gonna select fox squirrel here. If I wasn't sure what species it was, and this happens all the time, especially with plants and things that I'm maybe not quite as knowledgeable about. I oh, would just touch squirrels because squirrels puts it in the most specific bucket that I know about. Someone else will come along, I know, see my photo and then help put it into this more specific species level. But I'm gonna say fox squirrel because I know what it is and that might happen for you too. Maybe you see things you know about. It's automatically saving the location data of my photo because I've got that metadata set on my phone. It's automatically saving the date and the time that I took that photo. All of this is super important scientifically. If the squirrel was doing something interesting, maybe it was mating with another squirrel or it was eating some horse chestnut seeds from that tree that I've got out front. I could write that in this notes section. That's the place you could communicate more with scientists. There are some other options down here. It says geo privacy. If I wanted to make this geo private, meaning that it's not going to show the exact location of my pin, it's going to show the general area of my pin. That's an option. So if you feel like you're in an area that's sensitive, maybe you don't want to be sharing the location that you are, you could do geo privacy here. But if you don't care, leave it open because the more specific information, the better. So my geo privacy is set here to be open. It's telling me, it also says captive and cultivated. If you see somebody has taken a picture on a naturalist of a tulip, of their household cat, of an indoor plant, that's an example of a time that this would need to get switched to yes. But I know fox squirrels are definitely wild. And so, no, it's not captive and cultivated. There's also this project selection here below. This is where you could choose a specific project to add it to. You don't need to do that iNaturalist used to require that, but they've updated the platform. So now the City Nature Challenge and most other citizen science projects looking for data are going to automatically include information that's useful to them. So as long as you're within the boundaries of the Wasatch Project, which are those eight counties I talked about, and you're making your observation between the dates of the City Nature Challenge, April 30th to May 3rd, it's gonna automatically get added to the project. You don't need to do anything other than a simple observation like I'm doing here. So don't worry about that projects button. Then I'm gonna save it. 
I have my setting so that it won't automatically upload to the platform. This is because I'm often out on hikes. I'm away from my cell phone service. I don't want to chew through my data or my battery life trying to actively upload things to the site. So I can make my iNaturalist observation out on the trail if I'm away from Wi-Fi. And then when I get home or to a place that I'd like to then be able to use some internet, I can manually upload my photos. This is something I had to change in the settings. And if it's something that you think you'll be doing a lot, I recommend going into the settings bar and doing the same. Now it's going to upload my observation. OK, so now we've made an iNaturalist observation together. Let's check out where that observation went. Screen share number three of the day is the iNaturalist project for the Wasatch that's live online right now. I'm going to refresh it. I should have done that before you saved. And as of this reset fresh, whoa, we have exactly 1,000 observations that have come in since 12.01 AM yesterday morning <laughs> on April 30th um, of over 322 species. And this is telling us we've got 158 observers. If you haven't made any observations yet, once you do, you'll get added to that count. So get out there and start making some observations for us. And you can see my fox squirrel observation added, was added right here. So we can click on it to look at it a little more closely. I didn't really show you the photo that I had taken initially. So here's my photo that I identified as being the best one I could get of the specific fox squirrel. You can see the coloration around the eyes. You can see the head shape. You can see the tail. You can kind of see his underbelly, but not really. So I added in the second photo that has the underbelly there. Fox squirrels have this orangish underbelly color that other squirrels that live here in the state of Utah do not have. And so that's a key identifying feature um, as are some of the, these facial features I was showing. So there's no question that this is a fox squirrel. Someone else is gonna need to come in and verify that though, uh, which is an exciting thing. And so other people will do that. Once it's been verified, it's going to become, where is that icon? It's going to become, it's going to become research grade is what it's called. And so that means that the iNaturalist community has agreed upon what that thing is, uh, which is pretty cool. You can see here other observations that have been made of fox squirrels here in Salt Lake City. Um, or there's a chance that those are other, no, those are definitely other observations as fox squirrels. Um, and it has this little, exclamation point, you can see here that it's the iNaturalist platform is telling us that this is a non-native species that has been introduced. So that's kind of, that's another cool thing that iNaturalist talks about. Okay, enough about me and my observations. These are all the other cool things that people have been photographing. Something fun about this project is that it ranks the people making the most observations. It ranks the species that people are observing, oh, the, the most species that people are finding. So as of now, this user um, <laughs> who I know um, has found over 45 species. Awesome job. It's also showing us the most observed species. This is my favorite category that it shows. So as of this morning, people are most commonly observing the common dandelion. Not surprising, they're blooming all over my yard uh, and all over the city. So it's an easy nearby nature thing to photograph. More local <laughs> weeds growing in the city here. Mallards are commonly, uh, commonly the top most observed thing we see during the City Nature Challenge. This will all change and update as you get out there and find more information. Then you can see down here the map of where everything's being found. I love this map. Right here, Box Elder County, I think really only has one observation happening so far. They've got a fun event out there today at the Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge. And they're actually handing out some really cool neighborhood nature kits that the Natural History Museum of Utah put together. If you'd like to have one of those for free and to go look at some beautiful uh, wildlife, especially birds at the Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge. I recommend getting out there today. We have more information on our website about that. Um, and then a few, look at these few observations coming in here. You can again zoom in on this more to really start exploring and seeing what people are finding. That fox squirrel observation I just made exists here 
Um, I could click on any of these. Here's a picture from Sandy. It looks like it was somebody taking a photo of America and American Robin. It's been made research grade. How oh, cool. So that photo and all of the information about it are saved there on the iNaturalist platform. A really, really cool thing about iNaturalist is that it exists online, free and accessible to anyone, whether or not you have an account. And so you could go there if you don't have an account right now, iNaturalist.org, and you could search through the amazing species that people have found globally. They have really wonderful search engines. If you're just curious about American Robins, you can search for that. Globally, you could define it uh, by, by, by smaller parameters. You could look just in the state of Utah. You could look just by county and you'll see every observation that somebody's made. Certainly iNaturalist data is sort of limited in that it's only showing observations of people who use the platform because they know about it. <laughs> and so there are big areas of the country where there aren't that many iNaturalist observations. As you know, that's not because there's not nature there. There definitely is. There just aren't people there using the iNaturalist platform yet. So as we talked about earlier, over 63 million observations globally, that's starting to change. And so there's this really, really cool story that's being told online of species biodiversity globally. And it's all tagged with dates, locations. And so that becomes amazing data that we can be tracking for years and years and years to come. And so when I talk with uh, groups of students at the museum or elsewhere, we've looked at iNaturalist data. It's a really fun thing to explore with kids of all ages to really learn more about nature globally and the impact that you as a person can have when you're making those observations. It's such a special thing. And truly you're seeing things that nobody else is seeing. You're out on a hike, you see a beautiful thing blooming, take a photo of it, put it on a naturalist. You're out on a picnic, you see an insect crawling across your picnic blanket, take a picture of it, add it to a naturalist. Certainly do that this weekend during the City Nature Challenge, April 30th through May 3rd. But anytime the iNaturalist platform is up and happening always, the City Nature Challenge is just sort of a fun excuse to get involved in it, in this fun global effort. But really iNaturalist is an ongoing conversation that you can be contributing to at any point. And there are amazing stories of people taking a beach walk, photographing a giant fish that's washed up on shore. And it turns out it's something that's never been seen in that area before. People photographing snails, on vacation, it turns out it was a snail that had never been photographed. It had only been sketched before. Scientists knew it existed, but they had never seen it. You can be the eyes and ears for scientists globally. And that's a pretty amazing thing. So thank you for helping to contribute to all of that. And I hope that as you're exploring, you have a really fun time with it. I certainly do. And it really has made me a better naturalist and appreciate I appreciate much more the nature that's all around me all the time. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for sharing your energy and enthusiasm and zest for this project. I had a quick question for you as somebody who likes to make observations. Is there a better time of day to make observations or does it really matter? It's a great question, Alex. And I think Certainly, of course, if you're taking a photo of something, you need to have lighting to take a photo. The better the lighting is, the better the photo is, but you could bring lights with you. And so people definitely make observations of things at night. I think it depends on what you're looking for. There are fabulous times of day to get out and observe insects. I love to go out and find insects in the morning. I pull, I go outside and I you know, move rocks and I move chairs in my yard because insects are underneath them having a little sleep or a rest and it's colder. So they don't get away from you quite as quickly. And so I appreciate photographing insects when it's a little chillier out because they're easier to capture. Um, though that said, there are times of day where I know that if I go walk around this one side of my house that gets really warm, that's a really excellent time for me to find jumping spiders that live there. I can find multiple species of jumping spiders on the side of my house because it's warm and they're hanging out there. Birds, of course, are active during all certain times of day. If I'm trying to go find fun species along the Jordan River, I love to take evening walks because I might see beavers but I'll likely see muskrats and I'll see other things. So I, I like to go at all times of day, depending on the sort of stuff that I'm trying to find. Awesome. So yeah. 
great tips. Well, I think you have definitely encouraged me to get outside and conduct some observations this weekend. <laughs> and I cannot wait to see the data after uh, May 9th uh, to see what we have observed right here in the Wasatch. So thank you so much, Ellen. We really appreciate your time and look forward to contributing to this awesome project. My pleasure, Alex. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time too. And again, thanks to UC for all the wonderful things you guys are doing. Uh, and to everyone watching this, you are a nature champion in some way. And that's an awesome, awesome thing to have as part of our community. So thanks to you guys. Awesome. Thank you.